Welcome everyone to this virtual workshop. My name is Matthew Adams, the director at the Albright Institute in Jerusalem and the MC for this event. The Albright is pleased to bring you a series of discussions in response to a recent book by Raphael Greenberg entitled The Archaeology of Bronze Age Levant from Urban Origins to the Demise of City-States, 3700 to 1000 BCE, published in 2019 by Cambridge University Press. I'll post a link in the chat to Amazon Smiles product page for the book. Albright Institute's your Amazon.com account. Amazon will automatically donate 0.5% of the purchase price from your eligible purchases to the Albright. I'll put those links down below as well a little bit later. We have with us today five panelists, archaeologists specializing in various facets of the Bronze Age Levant. Each will discuss aspects of the book that they have found of particular interest. We've given these scholars free latitude to comment on whatever they found useful or thought-provoking in the book and what might be missing or what might require new direction in research. The author, Raphael Greenberg, is also here to provide a response to the panelists. Rafi is an associate professor of archaeology at Tel Aviv University. He specializes in the study of early urban formations, economies, and institutions. He currently directs excavations at Tel Beira near the Sea of Galilee and is co-founder of MX Chavez, a nonprofit that monitors the political role of archaeology in Jerusalem and beyond. For more than 30 years, Rafi has published extensively on topics across the Bronze Age and beyond, all of which have prepared him to assemble the important volume under discussion today. The five panelists will speak first for about 10 minutes. Rafi will follow with a response of about 15. Afterward, the panelists and author will be able to discuss together according to their own inspiration. Without further ado, I now invite our first panelist, Meredith Chasson from the University of Notre Dame. Hi everyone from the wilds of Indiana. Um, I am so pleased to have had this opportunity to be included in this discussion. Um, and I'm really honored to be able to offer my thoughts on this book, on Arafi's book, um, because I really loved it. I loved reading it. It was so much fun for me because it really made me think about um, a lot of different issues that sometimes we take for granted or sometimes we forget about in terms of our assumptions about thinking about archaeological knowledge production. So I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to restrict my comments to, to basically three main takeaway things that I think are really important. One set of uh, great themes that I loved reading and thinking about, and then I'll stop there. So the first thing that I really loved about this book is the fact that it, it really emphasizes and celebrates a comparative perspective. As an anthropological archaeologist, I really like the fact that he, that Rafi set things up so he's asking similar questions about each of these time periods without grounding himself in really traditional tropes, whether those are neo-evolutionary or historical or biblical. He's trying to use the same toolkit through time. And that means we learn a lot more, I think, in those comparisons, thinking about um, structures in these societies. It really allows us to see and compare those structural elements and to think about how and why things change or how and why things stay the same. The other thing I really liked was this epistemological approach to building archaeological knowledge from the ground up at different scales, starting at the household and then moving to neighborhood, civic structures, the community, and then the greater region. I really feels it, it, it allows, it allowed Rafi to explore this, the Bronze Age in this region on its own terms and not always as the, you know, bastard red haired stepchild of, of either Egypt or Mesopotamia or somewhere else. It's not a cheap imitator of its neighbors. It's actually its own thing. And they're working as their own agents um, to make decisions. The third thing that is more of a comment, this is something that it really made me think about, um, is thinking about globalization. Obviously in anthropology, a lot of ethnographers talk about globalization and have for decades. Uh, and it made, this book made me reconsider um, a potterized whole notion about scapes and globalization. 
So back in 1990, Apadurai was writing about the complex relationships of culture and modernity. And in a lot of ways, he, he proposed that there are five different scapes. Uh, there are technoscapes, there are mediascapes, there are idioscapes, um, and there are ethnoscapes. So he's got these scapes, these landscapes. So he's using this, this metaphor of place and in some ways, I feel like some of those scapes are actually usable when we even think about early pre with this early prehistoric and early historic periods. Uh, it, it's not a perfect match, but in some ways it's still interesting. So for example, technoscapes. Technoscapes are technologies that allow globalization to happen, whether that's electronic banking or some other sort of technological innovations that that intensify interactions across space. In a lot of ways, I feel like the technology of craft production, irrigation, agricultural production, um, even, even trading, the technology of trading, how you trade, they all involve these bodies of knowledge and bodies of knowledges and practices that people had to teach to each other, learn and then practice to make those sorts of connections happen. And we see that when you move from the early Bronze Age to the Middle Bronze into the, into the later Bronze Age. And we see this, these connections, these technologies that allow those connections to greater Southwest Asia and the Mediterranean world, but they also represent those, those connections. Mediascapes and idioscapes are sort of tied together here, but when we think about, instead of, for a mediascape, instead of newspapers and the internet, we're dealing with trade goods. We're dealing with, with symbols and we're dealing with um, ideas and commodities and, and people's attachment to those things. And for idioscapes, that's when we're really getting into ideas of kinship and kingship and power. Um, and, and again, commodities, and we can think about Wingrow's branding that show up as powerful indexical signs, whether it's a Sarek or it's the, the type of pot you've got that comes during the late Bronze Age from somewhere else, or it's weapons in a burial. So taking this semiotic approach to sort of symbol index and icon to think about stuff and the people that are engaging with it, I feel like Rafi's book offers a foundation for trying to understand how early globalization worked, because I feel like there's some really great examples here. So those are my three sort of really, uh, really moments of appreciation for the approaches. I want to end with four quick, fascinating themes that are close to my own heart. Uh, first is placemaking. A lot of this book throughout the Bronze Age is all about placemaking. It's about anthropogenic transformation of countrysides, of waterways, of resources, and of settlement and communities. The second one is going to be memory work, especially with mortuary practices and people's relationship to the dead. I think he does a great job thinking about what, how we treat our, our dead and what it meant to those people back then and in later periods. I also think that there's a great attention to material culture. First, in the form, like Henry Glassy said, that, it, that material culture is culture made material. It's the expression of who these people think that they are or who they want to be. And secondly, there is also a real attention to a communities of practice approach, um, originating with Jean Lave and Etienne Wenger, thinking about the sociality of technology, of technological practices. And those include not only how to make pottery, but again, how to build a house, how to build a fortification wall how to make this trade happen that we want. So we, you get at the human beings behind all these artifacts and the built environment and the change to the outer land, the, the greater landscape. And the last theme that I really like is the attention to people's relationship with their stuff, not only in production, but also in consumption, whether you're thinking about grave goods. And I began to think again about inalienable possessions and Annette Weiner's whole model for inalienable possessions when we're thinking about grave goods, but also trade and exchange, um, but also his discussion about translation and 
these people are agents of change. They are making decisions to adopt writing or not adopt writing, to build a big wall or not build a big wall, to, to aggregate or not. And it's, it's not that they're dupes like, oh, well, we all wanna be Egyptian because the Egyptians are cool. They're, they're not some dupes of false consciousness, right? They are actually people making decisions to engage with material culture and ideas in their own way and way it makes sense to them. So I'll end with that, but thank you, Rafi, for writing this great book. And I am really looking forward to hearing what everybody else has to say. Thank you, Meredith. Next up, we have Artemis Georgiou from Cyprus American Archaeological Research Institute. Hi, thank you, Matt. So good morning, everyone. Um, like Max said, my name is Artemis Georgiou. I'm currently the Peltenberg Postdoctoral Research Fellow at CARI here in Nicosia. And I specialize in the study of the late Bronze Age Cyprus and the island's interconnections with other Mediterranean polities. Um, and so, as you can imagine, I'm probably the least uh, quick member of this panel to provide feedback on uh, Raphael Greenberg's book. Uh, but my intention is to discuss this publication from the viewpoint of the, of the wider Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so I was very impressed by this publication, which provides a, a truly holistic overview of the archaeology of the Bronze Age Levant. It presents a truly state-of-the-art synthesis um, uh, for an impressive chronological span of more than two and a half millennia um, or concerning an extended geographical region. Um, and reading the publication of Erola, I have gathered um, several aspects that really make it stand out as an important and fresh uh, piece of scholarly work. Um, firstly, the publication presents an, an informed synthesis that puts together an array of otherwise dispersed archaeological data, including the latest discoveries in the region. And while the author very skillfully integrates historiographic data by means of the preserved textual evidence, as well as the results of the implementation of scientific analysis on material remains and the latest directions in archaeological theory, um, I feel that the archaeological evidence remains the focal methodological tool. Uh, throughout the book, archaeological data constitute the solid baseline from which the period is viewed. And this is truly praiseworthy because it provides a solid bottom-up approach. And I think this is what Meredith was, was also saying uh, before. Um, the book concerns the communities that lived, that um, worked, worshipped, uh, cultivated, and died in the Levant of this period. And um, I was also impressed by the fact that the Levant is both uh, the center as well as the vantage point of this study. Um, and this does not mean to say that uh, the author neglects to provide the wider framework of neighboring cultures, so far from it. Um, I was very appreciative of this study from within, which I register as a very important methodological approach. And I quote, for instance, from chapter five, this chapter, like those that preceded it, focuses on the Levant as a local theater of activity in tune with broadened trends in which relations of production, consumption, and exchange serve as a portal of social relations, political practice, and cultural transmission. Um, and I also enjoyed that while it subfades within the overall chronological frame, framework is uh, presented separately, the author links the period under scrutiny with uh, the characteristics of the preceding and following phases, um, resulting in a very cohesive outline uh, of the Bronze Age with clear indications of the continuities and the transformations uh, or the changes. Um, I really enjoyed the introduction, uh, which I found not only uh, informative, but at several points very thought provoking it was truly helpful to include an overview of the history of research in this area to address the way scholars in the past have approached uh, this region and how we often still carry their interpretations, sometimes um, as a burden, considering the loaded terms that are just impossible to discard. And the depiction of archaeological artifacts as, as black boxes uh, in our attempts to disentangle past communities, I found that ingenious and it truly captures the significance of the study of ancient material culture. And um, I think I'm, I might steal this expression for funding applications. It's really to the point. 
Um, so to move on to, uh, more specific elements of this work that I found very relevant to my own research. Well, first of all, this uh, study provided a much needed context on the one hand for the communities in the Levant that received Cypriot imports and on the other for the mechanism underlying the export of Levantine um, artifacts found in Cyprus. Um, I really appreciate the value paid in the influx of the earliest uh, Cypriot imports and the strata of Levantine sites um, of the late Middle Bronze Age. And the significance of these finds was made very clear, not only for ascertaining commercial and other connections between the two regions, but also for the invaluable use of Cypriot ceramics for establishing a solid chronological framework within the Levant and synchronizing it with other Mediterranean regions. Um, and I also agree with Rafi's advice for caution in assessing the popularity of the important imported wares in the Levantine strata, considering um, archaeological bias. And indeed, uh, shards of imported pottery are much more visible compared to the local ceramics and have received disproportionately greater significance. Um, and on that matter, I also correlate fully with Rafi's appeal for a more systematic and contextual and meaningful registering and dissemination of the imported Cypriot and Mycenaean wares. Um, a more inclusive approach to this phenomenon would enable us to identify the modes of interaction, uh, delineate trade routes and specify the nature of uh, these connections. Um, and I would also like to address the regional element in addition to the chronological aspects of the, of the imported Cypriot wares. Um, for instance, white slip is often grouped together, but uh, typological studies uh, have shown that uh, different workshops on the island produce stylistically different white slip uh, vessels. And a meticulous study of, of the vessels found in the Levant could indeed indicate the origin of, of these vessels within Cyprus without conducting any petrographic or other interdisciplinary analysis, only by looking at the style. Um, concerning the presentation of Mediterranean trade during the 14th and uh, the 13th centuries BC, um, the author moves away uh, from the often repeated international spirit of royal or elite rat commerce and presents evidence for the operation of low level trade alongside the, the big players already in this early stage. And I found this a very, to be a very fresh approach, approach that is, is gaining momentum in archaeological scholarship in the current years. And, and also substantiates the continuity of trading activities of these low level um, economic places, uh, players after the collapse of the imperial regimes. Um, and another aspect that I found relevant to my own studies was the intricacy of discerning ethnic statements through the extant archeological record, which is a thorny issue for uh, Bronze Age Cyprus as well. So in addressing the Egyptian presence in the Levant, um, Rafi advises caution and admits to the limitations currently in place stating, and I quote, what is the archeological evidence for Egyptian presence as an occupying power? Can Egyptian colonizers be identified in the material culture? And what is the nature of their uh, interaction and entanglement with local communities? Are we even certain who is Egyptian and who is not? End of quote. And I'm, I fully associate with these concerns and I very much appreciate this, this critical approach. Um, and finally, in tackling another heated subject, that of the end of the late Bronze Age, um, the overview presented in this work is, is also very fresh because um, I, I found it very useful to move away from focusing on mass scale destructions. Um, and rather deal with the shift in economic and political and social terms, um, uh, be it the demise of the city-states, the um, retraction of the Egyptian hegemony, um, or the breakdown of the Mediterranean world system. And I was very pleased to see the acknowledgement of the continuity of commercial strategies linking Cyprus with the Southern Levant on the basis of the evidence provided by Cypriot-made uh, Aegean-style finewares introduced to the Levant on the one hand and imported uh, maritime transport containers, what we call Canaanite jars uh, to Cyprus. Um, 
and I will work more on that on a future project. So that provided a, 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 um, a perfect baseline for this study. Um, just a few remarks that I, I felt uh, needed, a, um, um, I, I would be happy to have a, a, an elaboration on. Um, I, wish, I wish there was more integration of the evidence provided by the Northern part of this region. Um, even though it's made very, very clear in the introduction uh, why this part was um, uh, uh, left out. Um, and I, I wish there was a more organic discussion with sites such as Ugarit or with the Hittites, um, such as a, um, a discussion of the significance of, of the Battle of, of, of Kadesh, for example, um, and how this affected this region. Uh, and perhaps um, the inclusion of the word South in the title would um, make this more clear. Um, and uh, I would also like to have a more in-depth analysis of the end of the Late Bronze Age. And I realized that this would be a, a whole new book. Um, but I'm, um, you know, the discussion of for Philistia, for example, there are a lot of loaded uh, interpretations in the previous scholarship that are, 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 are rather briefly presented, which I, I also I enjoyed. Um, and like I said, these are, are extremely minor issues. Um, so all in all, I found this publication to be highly engaging. Um, it concisely outlines a more than two and a half millennia long span in a masterful manner, uh, bringing in fresh perspective and up-to-date archaeological data. I have learned a lot and I will surely consult it for my own research and I think it would be perfect uh, as an undergraduate uh, curriculum um, for uh, the Bronze Age Mediterranean. Um, and to close my presentation, um, I'd like to also quote uh, from uh, the book, uh, Rafi states, my goal has been to string together sufficient evidence to support a narrative against which additional indeed future discoveries may be measured. And uh, I congratulate uh, him for fully attaining to this aspiring task and uh, wish him all the best for um, his future research. Thank you. Great, thank you, Artemis. Next up, we have Jack Green from the American Center of Research in Amman, Jordan. Jack. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to say thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Matt, for this and, and Rafi. And uh, it's been a wonderful pleasure and an honor to be invited to be part of this. I'm located in ACOR, American Center of Research in Amman, Jordan. And my specialized research interest is in the uh, late Bronze Age and early Iron Ages of the Southern Levant and also Jordan. I did my PhD on a site in Jordan called Telesidea, which is also mentioned in and highlighted in the late Bronze Age uh, section of the book. Uh, so it was really wonderful to be able to read this book. And I want to congratulate Rafi on uh, a great achievement. Uh, so I just have a few remarks that I'd like to share. First of all, I have the book in my hand uh, as a physical copy. We managed to get this into the library in uh, ACOR. And um, so I was able to actually read the book from a physical version, which I know wasn't possible for many of you because of the COVID-19 pandemic, of course. But I just want to say as well, just like any good thriller, or Agatha Christie novel or something, you want to, I, I immediately went to the end of the book. I wanted to find out what happened. Um, so, because I'm interested, of course, in the late Bronze Age, I went straight for the late Bronze Age chapter. And of course, and I was really excited and um, uh, illuminated by what I was reading because finally I'm seeing uh, how all of these different ideas are, um, are, are coming together and all the evidence is being presented in a way that really seems to make a lot of sense. Um, I'll say that this book um, does what many of the other books, the textbooks uh, on the Southern Levant or the Central and Southern Levant uh, do, which is, for example, you know, you have uh, Tom Levy's Archaeology of Society in the Holy Land, which since the uh, mid 1990s has been the sort of one of the main uh, textbooks for the region. Uh, there's, of course, Archaeology of Ancient Israel. There's um, more recently, um, there's uh, 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 Killebrew and Steiner's Archaeology of the Levant, the Oxford Handbook. And of course, all of these other volumes, they're written um, 
by multiple individuals, they're edited volumes. And what Rafi has been able to do is uh, through this really masterful work is to bring together uh, all of the evidence, but under one voice and one, um, one sort of steady flow of, of narrative. Um, so it's much easier to read this and much easier to look at the continuities and changes as are presented over time uh, through the different chapters. So I found that particularly refreshing and I think this will become uh, you know, the go-to uh, book for the region. Um, and also uh, just to echo what uh, Meredith was uh, saying earlier as well, that the book doesn't heavily go into archeological or anthropological theory, but it does present many of the theories that other people have presented, which are resulting from um, those thoughts. So it's broadly a social constructivist kind of approach. So the idea that human development, you know, is socially situated and the knowledge is uh, constructed through interaction with others. But we do see, of course, a deliberate avoidance of the cultural heritage, sorry, cultural historical approaches, um, which, but you do bring in as well, some of those important and key textual sources when they shed light on the uh, social and political situation. So I think that's very refreshing, but as was said earlier with the ethnic aspects, it's refreshing to sort of move away from that and go more towards these sort of more technological changes and uh, the ways in which people are adapting their landscapes. And I think that's refreshing. Um, I will also say that um, the way that you present the archeological data, Rafi, is really good. I think you've got the right balance between detail and nuance and doesn't get too bogged down, but there's enough detail there for you really to learn, the, for anyone beginning in this area to really learn um, some of the core aspects of the basic material culture, the pottery uh, especially, and the technology related to the pottery. Um, and I find that really refreshing. Also, I love the way that you um, just bring in the interpretations um, in a really clear and succinct way. And I was particularly drawn to one uh, quote, which I would like to uh, give here, which is in the context of late Bronze Age mortuary practices, which is one of my areas of interest. Um, it's in relation to the fluid identities, uh, particularly in the context of cultural interaction with Egypt. And it's on page 336 and uh, I quote, here I would like to bring these instances of mortuary behavior into, relation, into relationship with each other and with the trajectory of the late Bronze Age society. The treatment of the dead, the symbolic and sensory nature of commemorative practices, the advertisement of status and the cultural affinities expressed in late Bronze Age tombs, may be interpreted as scripted performances of disparate identities within a South Levantine society characterized more than at any time in the Bronze Age by deep divisions and weak collective institutions. So although there's a lot to unpack there in the preceding parts, you explain exactly you know, the evidence that's, that's there that, that explains this, that is able to show and demonstrate exactly what you're saying. So I think that that is really good. You're able to definitely weave the evidence with the interpretation in a very strong way. Um, my next point on this is the regional perspective. So on the Levant in general, of course, it's a very slippery term. It's difficult, it's never a perfect term. And I think though that the way that you've, what you've represented here is a nice sort of unit um, it's difficult to include Northern Levant, as you explain. Um, you've got Lebanon, Southern Syria, Jordan, Israel, and Palestine. And I know that would have been great to include Northern Syria and also parts of Arabia and even Cyprus, because of course, some would include Cyprus within their definition of Levant. I do think this, this focus does make a lot of sense without also avoiding getting into the Mesopotamian sphere too much. And of course, uh, to have the acknowledgement and inclusion of Palestine as a place alongside Israel is very important. Uh, from the uh, perspective of Jordan, which is the focus of my own work and research, it's really good to have the integration of those Jordanian sites into the narrative because they've often been left out in some uh, other um, overviews of the region, partly because of perhaps unpublished materials and so forth, but you've made good use of 
of the site reports and the, uh, I know it's tricky with some unpublished sites, but you've got Zirakun and Jawa, Pella, Tel Omeri and Saibia, Bir Allah. So many of these important sites. And of course, I would encourage anyone who's studying the archeology span of Jordan to look at this book and to uh, integrate uh, what you've uh, discussed in the broader terms with the uh, uh, sites, of course, west of the Jordan and uh, across the wider region. It really helps to give a much broader regional perspective. Um, I don't have a lot of critiques of this. I would say that one of, of your book, I, I would say that um, what you do here, of course, you're presenting a lot of uh, data and material from processual uh, based uh, studies that go back to the 80s and 90s, of course. And then, of course, the more sort of social archaeology, post processual approaches that have come in from the late later 90s and into the 2000s. So it's kind of a bit of a hybrid in that sense of bringing together the processual and the post processual. And of course, the big critique of the new archaeology is was the um, you know, the difficulty of how do you address the issue of identity and people? You know, how do you identify people? And you talk about householders, villagers, pastoralists, elites, warriors, farmers, and corvée laborers. And of course, the, the uh, fluid identities, but some aspects of the agency was, for me, it didn't always come out so clearly. It felt that there were more processes that were happening to uh, people. and. And I, I guess for me, a little bit more on the people and particularly an aspect of gender. I think gender was not something that came out too much. Maybe it just wasn't possible to include, but thinking about gender and age and other those aspects of identity are also important. Uh, just the last thing really is that um, just this kind of trajectory of, of the Levant over this period and, and the boom and bust economies of that you see and it's so interesting to see this in this collected work looking uh, back and looking forward in time how you see so many repeats happening over and over again uh, you see societies developing sometimes quite rapidly urban settlements and then you of course see the cracks beginning to appear and whether those societies then begin to weaken or collapse as a result of internal uh, collapse or change or or external factors can can vary of course but of course there's the imperial factors and the region the powers uh, surrounding the Levant that that end up um, kind of having a, a significant impact so you've got this kind of but you still got this sort of baseline of recovery that keeps happening again and again I think that was really interesting it made me think what if the Levant was an island and was able to somehow resist these external influences. But then of course it wouldn't be the Levant because the Levant is all about how the people and the places there have absorbed and adapted ideas and technologies from the outside and made it something of their own. Um, uh, lastly, it's really just a question to Rafi, you know, what, what is next? Um, my sense is that looking at as, as was said before, the aspect of technology and society seems to be the really strongest theme here. And I wondered if that was something you wanted to unpack more. And I also noted the black box, uh, the inner workings of the technological change, which is, I thought, really fascinating. I think that would be a really fruitful area, but it would be great to hear your thoughts and feedback on that. But thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Next up, we have Lynn Welton from the University of Toronto. Lynn? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, first, I want to start by uh, thanking Matt and Rafi for uh, having me be involved today. Uh, I'm really glad to have an opportunity to uh, discuss this book because I really enjoyed reading it. And also, um, I'm really happy to see a work like this come out. Uh, before I go any further, I'll just make a couple of comments to introduce myself for people listening who don't know me. Uh, for today's purpose, anyway, I'm primarily a Northern Levantine archaeologist. I work at the site of Taltaina in the Amok Plain in southern Turkey, and I focus there on the early Bronze Age and on the early Iron Age periods at the site. Um, but I've also been spending more time 
recently focusing a bit to the south. So I've been working with Graham Phillip on a project looking at changes in herding practices and animal mobility uh, for the period from the Calcolithic through to the Middle Bronze Age at sites in Jordan and in Syria. So I'm approaching Rafi's book today largely from those two main perspectives. Um, in terms of general comments, uh, I think it, it almost goes without saying, but I am going to say it, uh, that in my mind, this book is really a, a remarkable synthesis of all the existing evidence that's out there. Um, it's one that's been badly needed because there's been so much new and recent work in the last decade or more that has shifted understandings on a lot of key issues that had become ingrained in the literature. And there's never really been a place where some of those changes in thinking have been drawn together properly and synthesized. So uh, I think this volume is clearly an important contribution in that respect. Um, that being said, that's not all there is to this volume because I think there's also a lot of new thoughts and new reframing of important issues that will make this volume an important benchmark or a yardstick against which people are going to measure new shifts in interpretation as things go forward. And I think that the quote that Artemis highlighted um, at the end of her comment uh, really uh, draws that out as something that Rafi was trying to do and has achieved. Um, he, what he's done is really lay out kind of a coherent vision of, of the Bronze Age in the Levant that people are going to be comparing their own new data and interpretations to. Um, I really appreciate that um, as much as is possible, Rafi also sort of dispenses with outdated thinking and um, starts from the ground up and builds the evidence, build, builds uh, narratives from the evidence. So it's a sort of fresh approach that doesn't get bogged down in some of the um, maybe outmoded ways of thinking about things. So I really appreciated that aspect of it. Um, I'll also offer a couple of more specific comments on things that struck me as I was reading through the book. And um, I should say that although I already had read the book, I only became involved in this discussion uh, a few days ago. So uh, I should say some of these ideas are maybe a little bit half formed, but I'm gonna try and focus on some bigger picture things rather than specific details. And um, I'm gonna focus on the chapter on the Intermediate Bronze Age because that's something that uh, is most in my wheelhouse. Uh, and also I think it offers a good sort of um, example of the ways in which um, Rafi's book contributes in general. So unsurprisingly, as a northerner, uh, I'm particularly interested in Rafi's discussions about interactions between the northern and southern Levant. And in this case, especially about the dynamics uh, of the relationships during what I would call in the north the EB4, or what's referred to for the southern Levant as the intermediate Bronze Age, um, but essentially covering the second half of the third millennium. Um, it's been some time now since the revision of the chronology for the end of the Southern Levantine 83 period and the beginning of the Intermediate Bronze Age that moved that transition quite a bit earlier than it had previously been considered to be. And um, that really sh reshaped the synchronisms between the South and what's going on in the North. So it correlates the dispersal of settlement from walled towns in the EB3 period with the time where Ebla's um, in its ascendancy and it's at the height of its political power in Syria, rather than with the period um, where the, uh, the immediately following the destruction of Palestine at Ebla a couple of hundred years later. So it's a period where the political dynamics are quite a bit different in Syria than they were originally assumed to be. And I think we're all still only really just at the very beginnings of starting to come to terms with some of the, the implications of that. Um, and this applies from both a Northern and a Southern perspective, figuring out what parts of our former reconstructions need to be revised um, that have rested on specific assumptions about those relationships between the North and the South and about the chronology of those relationships. Um, so for example, and this is something I think Rafi stresses quite well in the book, um, this change has completely reshaped the discussion about uh, the relationship between the period of aridity that occurs at the end of the third millennium and the dispersal of walled towns that occurs in the southern Levant. Um, for a long time it was taken for granted that those two things were contemporaneous with each other um, and the shift really complicates the narratives and the ongoing arguments about the relationship between climate change and social collapse and it requires us to rethink a lot of those associations and I think that's only really at the beginning of starting to happen. 
I also really appreciated um, some of Rafi's reframing of some of the major changes in the this period in the Intermediate Bronze Age that shows that um, although there are direct connections with Syria that are most clear in the northern parts of the Southern Levant, um, the relationships with Syria wasn't necessarily just a matter of emulation of Syrian elite behavior that appears mostly in the ceramic assemblage and things like black wheel made ware or other drinking vessels that show similarities to Syrian examples. Although the, the shift from communal feasting to drinking behaviors is quite significant, the, but those shifts are part of and somehow related to a much more substantial social and economic restructuring that had impacts throughout the region that go beyond just the northern parts of the Southern Levant and um, have broader impacts that aren't necessarily directly visible in the impacts of like direct connections with Syria. So we know it's not, it's not a new idea that the population during the Intermediate Bronze Age is maybe more mobile, but Rafi's discussion of the sort of economic restructuring during this period um, and its relationship you know, to ideas that were proposed by Tony Wilkinson and Graham Phillip and others um, recently um, with regard to um, this restructuring being a part uh, related to an expansion of the wool industry in Syria. I think um, really ends up sort of flipping the discussion or the narrative about what's happening in the Intermediate Bronze Age from one that sort of focuses on disintegration or dare I say, you know, devolution that might've been the focus in previous discussions and shows it to be in fact, a time period that's remarkably dynamic. That's a period of economic opportunism, of flexibility and of resilience. So I think, um, in doing this, Rafi really has made it clear um, that all of this changes the ways in which we should study this period and should, we should study the Intermediate Bronze Age. It makes it critical for us to shift our focus away from our traditional bias towards tail-based excavations, to look at more ephemeral evidence from maybe more arid zones. It changes the kinds of approaches and methodologies we should be using and the kinds of evidence we should be collecting. For example, it really brings things like the commodification of animals and animal products into focus as a really critical area um, in a way that it never was uh, approached before. And I think it also shifts some of the geographical areas of focus that are going to drive things in the next couple of decades. So for example, um, pending political situation, um, areas like southern Syria are going to become really critical for our understanding of what's happening during this period. And it's really going to drive the kinds of questions that people are asking uh, going forward. So in these comments, I really only focus on sort of one chapter. Uh, and I, but I think it gives a good example of the ways in which um, Rafi's managed to make a sort of coherent and cogent synthesis and narrative of the evidence that gives us an idea of the ways that we need to be reframing our research questions and um, reorganizing our research strategies uh, in future. And I think the same could easily be said for basically each of the chapters on all the different subperiods of the Bronze Age that Rafi discusses. Um, I'll leave some of those other chapters to people who know those periods better in particular. Um, but I think uh, this, the Intermediate Bronze Age chapter is a good example of, of ways that we can um, take away from Rafi's really amazing work, um, things that we should all be doing um, to sort of drive forward our interpretations of the past. So I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you, Lynn. Next up, and finally of the panelists, we have Yuval Yakutieli of Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. Thank Yuval. you, Mark. I'm honored to participate in this panel from Beersheba in Israel. And I wish to congratulate Rafi on his book. Uh, many of us play with the idea of writing sometime a comprehensive volume about the time or a region, a kind of an histoire total. But it is so extremely complex that not many of us dares to. Once in a few decades, someone embarks on such a grand project. Rafi did it and did it excellently. In view of the amount of archeological work constantly performed in our region, it is amazing what a huge data had to be processed and then to be packed into a single coherent volume. Rafi did it brilliantly. The product is extremely enriching and offers lots of fresh and intelligent outlooks. 
It shows Rafi's deep archaeological knowledge, a wonderful writing ability, and a unique theoretical and political awareness. It is outstanding also due to the fact that it is not restricted to Israel-Palestine, but also deals with the archaeologists of Jordan and Lebanon. Personally, I also praise Rafi's clever choice to keep distance from the Iron Age and its multiple biblical burdens. The archaeology of the Bronze Age in the Levant is then an amazing production, which I had immediately turned into a textbook in my classes. Rafi's last sentence in the book is, the future of the Bronze Age lies in the telling of it. And indeed, telling is a major issue I wish, I wish to comment on. The translation of the archaeological record into a narrative brings about inevitable interpretive elements, giving explanations and meanings to finds, singling out events, and arranging them according or arranging them as causes and effects, accentuating certain facts and silencing others. Different narrators, unsurprisingly, deduce different causes, effects, and events conveying them in connection with their own unique perspectives and aims. As someone who shares the profession of a storyteller of the past, I can say that my tale, which is considerably more fragmented and limited than Rafi's, is not necessarily similar to his. Yet I can unconditionally state that Rafi presents a superb, consistent, innovative, and original archeological tale, which I admire. Rafi's narrative shows an original thought based in many places on his own research and on collaborative work he did with his students. It is the insider's touch which gives the interpretations an extra value. Beyond giving a lot of data, I especially like the significant introductions and summaries on each period, which offer excellent analysis. I'm also very keen on Rafi's writing style, which brings into the archaeological narrative concepts such as the Rashomon effect, while referring to different historiographies about EB2 Arad, or, and this is really lovely, his imaginative description of a choreography that intermediate Bronze Age settlements and burial sites perform in and adjacent to abandoned EB3 urban sites. I just can imagine them dancing around them. A complaint, Rafi. You should realize that by changing the by now common NCMW into the SLMW, you disappoint a generation of BGU ceramics class students whose nickname for this type of pottery, to remember it in their exams, Nekmau, will now turn useless. Thank God you didn't change the KKW which they remember in another imaginative way. Another terminological change is that under your pen, the EB1A sausage-shaped house, which replaced the earlier label of the apsidal house, became now a safety pin-shaped house. And a more archeological note, writing about the Intermediate Bronze Age, Rafi imagined that the IBA men as a man with a fine dagger. And although dismissing Amorite and Korgan theories about IBA in the Negev, he proposed that a northern mobility and cultural transmission with the north did exist here. My student Leo Schwimmers and my current work in the Negev Highlands vindicates Rafi's proposal. In the last few years, we indeed see the man with the dagger. We follow the depictions of people carrying crescent pommel dagger, as known also from Ebla on the left, which is common in a distinct rock art style in the Negev. Analyzing uh, uh, the other attributes of this style, specific headdress, bows, associated depictions of lions and bulls, specific patina and stratigraphic arrangement, as well as its passive distribution, proves that it is an IBA phenomenon. Hence, Rafi, we add support to your interpretation indeed a man with a dagger, and indeed a flavor of the North. However, we still believe that this phenomenon in the Negev has to do mainly with the copper production and its distribution towards Egypt through Sinai. Finally, 
I want to use this opportunity to express my appreciation for Rafi, who for me, beyond being a great archaeologist, is also a role model of an academic political activist, morally engaged in our region's complex political realities, and above all, for being a true friend. So thank you, Rafi. Thank you, Yuval. That wraps up our panelists. Rafi, anything to say? Yes, well, um, I guess I'm up for a sainthood soon. So <laughs> I'm not accustomed to receiving so many uh, encomiums. But thank you, everyone, for, for um, uh, describing what you liked about the book. And uh, oddly enough, uh, you might be surprised to know that I enjoyed writing it. So that uh, what, what you said is stuff that, that made me enjoy writing it. That is my ability to, to string together these periods, to, to tell a story, to work from the bottom up, to gather all this material together and make sense out of it. You know, I, of course, there's a lot of stuff missing. And there's a glaring error on about page two, I think, which nobody has caught yet. And I don't know if anybody will. Maybe Alex Jaffe will at some point. Uh, I challenge you, Alex, to do that. Um, but, uh, and, and I'm sure there are many other errors in it, but, but still uh, it, it, it was enjoyable. And, and the way I went about it, I, I have to say, and I did mention this in the introduction, was by teaching, was by teaching these periods, was by teaching these broad introductions. And a lot of people, uh, I think, dislike or are a little uh, wary of teaching uh, first year introductory courses because it's, you know, it's just a bunch of people that know nothing and you can basically say anything in the course and they'll gobble it up and often mishear you and, and say weird things. But um, having to tell people who had never studied archaeology before what it's all about gave me a, um, uh, it, it gave me a storyline. So I used the introductory course and then I used specific uh, period specific seminars, which I did with more advanced students. And this is how I stitched this, stitched this together. And I really thank my, um, uh, uh, you know, the administration of my university for not giving me any leave of absence or, or anything to write the book, that kind of thing. You always read about somebody saying, I took a year off and sat on an island and wrote the book. And I realized that I could never have done it that way. If I had taken the year off, I just would have gone fishing or something. I don't fish, but that kind of activity. Um, so, so actually working this through students, through discussion, through interaction with people is what made it possible. And, and, um, and I did what you always tell other people. We all give this advice to everyone else. And that is, if you have a huge task, break it up into little bits. <laughs> And that's what I actually did. I just broke it up into little bits and it wrote itself. And I really want to mention um, a shout out to Matt and the Albright Institute because I did spend uh, several months in which I actually um, stopped reading my email uh, and, and stopped uh, reading the news and, and everything and just focused. And that, and that gave me the final push over the top of the top of the um, whatever the, the hill here. So, so that's how I actually did it and it, and it is doable. Um, and, and it is what you said, it's my story. And in many ways it sums up what I've been doing and, and Jack, you want me to write an, another volume. And um, I think Artemis said, what happened to the end of the late bronze, the beginning of the Iron Age, the end of the late bronze and why did you stop? And really uh, some, some things are, Often you have technical uh, or, or even formal issues that help you frame, frame your writing. So I was asked by Cambridge University Press, by Norm Yaffe, specifically to write about the Levant in the Bronze Age. And someone else is writing about the Levant in the Iron Age. And then because they had already published um, Glenn Schwartz's book on, on Syria. So it had to include whatever was not included in that book. And that really sketched it out for me. And then, you know, you make um, lemonade out of lemons. So I said, okay, if this is the Levant that I'm being offered, then I'm gonna justify it. And, 
And I think, it, you know, it has, you can justify it. You, you can work with a Levant that's that size. Uh, and then stretching it out to Ugari, you know, it would have gotten me into the Ugari texts, into the Ugari cosmology. Um, and, and that's not my field. I would have, I would have been lost there. So, so it's a combination of, of the way things are framed and, um, and, and, what, and what one likes to do. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll uh, just react to, to a, couple of, um, a couple of other things. And, and I'm glad that, uh, that um, Jack brought up a few of the, of the glaring absences, uh, such as gender. And I just happened to look in my index, which is, they have a horrible system of indexing. So it's, it's really not a great index. It all has to be done with the PDF automatically or something. And it, it, it's a pain in the, in the neck. But there isn't anything, or there's very little on gender. But there's a reason for that. And the reason is that I had to sort of uh, find a common denominator for all this material that I was bringing together. And it can't be better than what people have done. And what people have done is just not conducive to some of these truly important and significant ways of, of looking at the material. So that when you said I was looking more at process than at agency, that's because I had, you know, the cultural historians gave me the data to work with. And really I stand on their shoulders and I, I will always acknowledge the work of, of 100 years of sort of standard traditional archeology. span uh, they gave us that. And then in came the processualists. They came late. Um, they came uh, without really understanding what processual archaeology was, but they brought that sort of outlook into, um, into our neck of the woods. On, I, I would say on both sides of the Jordan, really. I mean, quite heavily on, on the eastern side as well as, as on the western side. And that's basically what has been published. Whereas the um, more interpretive work, uh, uh, our ability to, to, see, to see agency, to see, um, to see beyond uh, you know, the standard work, that, that is just curtailed by what has been published. That's, uh, so, so I definitely see that as a challenge or as these things really have to be pointed out. They have to be pointed out and, and if, if, you know, if, any, if anyone listening is writing a review yes you know say what's missing you know what what is on the agenda for the for, for the next book because we really do need these books every couple of decades um, uh, you can actually see how, how how the books are spaced you know they're about 25 years apart it's just it's generations you know it's biblical so so that that's how it is uh, so I, I I completely accept that criticism uh, and I could I could probably add add a few more things to it myself, um, you know places where I where I felt I didn't have enough to say or wasn't wasn't able to to to, to be a an up to date archaeologist the way I would like to be. Um, um, where do I go from here? I have an interesting answer for this. I'm not writing, at least not in the foreseeable future, a sequel. And I'm actually taking a break from, from the Levantine uh, Bronze Age, except for our work on Be'erach. That's, we're going to push that through. We have really interesting stuff in the pipeline and, and that'll happen. And of course there are students who are working on this material. So I'm not abandoning, I'm not gonna abandon them. I'm not saying, you know, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off to other to, to other climbs, but um, I am starting a new project in contemporary archaeology or archaeology of of, of, the, of, of our age, uh, and I'm uh, I will soon you know talk about that, but this isn't the time really to talk about it, except that this is this is where it's taking me, or where life is taking me, and and my interests are taking me. I think it's it's really vital that we um, that we think about where archaeology is headed. And I've been doing a lot of thinking. Uh, I was on leave last year at Brown University. I had uh, I had had and have been having very long discussions with 
Yanis Hamilakis and other people uh, in that you know in that world, and um, and it is one of the things that troubles me is the colonial legacy of archaeology, the, the one that we're dragging along with us on our backs ever since um, uh, Warren started digging in Jerusalem, pretty much. Uh, and I'm and and I think this is a task that we are all faced with. Is is how to how to decolonize our archaeology, and it, it it's not only by doing different archaeologies like archaeologies of the contemporary era, but it's it's breaking down um, some of the old ways of, of doing things, and I think that's a challenge that that lies before us. And I had this sense that you know once I had wrapped this up and I said, look, this is what people have done. Uh, this is as far as this as I can see. You know, the, this is as far as it gets us. And there's a lot of stuff that isn't being said, and there are a lot of um, there there are a lot of uh, preconceptions that are that are embedded in in the way the material has been presented. So what do we need to do now? You know, how are we going to rewrite uh, the archaeology of these periods for the future? What or what are our students going to do? Uh, uh, that's why I'm really interested in the dialogue with people who are younger than myself and not, you know, with um, the Khtiari, you know, with the old, the old folks. So I'm, I'm very much appreciative both of, of this panel and I'm sure of a lot of the people who are, who are listening, um, who, who are the archaeologists of the future. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll stop here and maybe answer specific questions, if there are any from the panel or, or from people out there. Great, thanks Rafi. We can now open it up to the rest of the panel. You can turn your mics on, speak freely, uh, but courteously, of course. I have a question for Rafi. Um, I'm wondering in terms of archeological practice, uh, and you know, I'm coming from the, early, from the early Bronze Age, obviously, that's my, that's my wheelhouse. But I'm, I'm thinking about, would it be helpful to problematize that real basic dichotomy in residential versus non-residential spaces in the built environment? Um, partly I'm wondering this because I was having discussions with my US Southwest archeologist friend, Donna Glowacki, and she was like, you can't just say public or non-residential architecture. I mean, where do you put the privies then? Where do you put, you know, where, where do you put other sorts of stuff. There's lots of stuff that's not non-residential. And do you think generally for the Bronze Age, we should try to be a little bit more clear about what, what's the importance? Why are these assumptions that it's just residential versus not everything else? Like, what does that say about the way we approach the archeological record? Um, and what does that say about actually what we can learn? Because if we restrict ourselves to this very dichotomous view, what are we missing? So I'm just wondering what you think about that. <laughs> okay, I, you know, we have, in this country, we, we studied archeology span in very clear boxes so that you'd have an introduction and it would start out with um, settlement pattern and then uh, temples, fortifications, houses, and pottery or something like that, you know, and other stuff. Um, so, uh, and, and actually in the, in the early Bronze Age, I was still sort of there and I was trying to move away from that. And I did succeed, I think, in moving away from that in the later chapters. Um, so, so this, this division, you know, the, you know, it goes to Foucault, it goes to how, how we, how we, how we, um, classify everything around us. And obviously, these are, these are some of the things that are embedded in ways of thinking that are modernist, that are that are that are part of the baggage that we're carrying with us. And uh, I guess one of the ways one of the ways that I found I, I I'm I, I'm a very slow thinker. You know that I can't I can't I, I can't respond very quickly. So I'll just lean on something that that I've already thought about. And that is that when I um, when I try to use the the archaeology of the senses approach to various things, I, I discovered that just thinking about the sounds and the smells and all those other senses that are ignored in archaeology gave us it gives you or gives me um, 
a sense of all that other stuff that's going on. Uh, this happened when I looked at the Tel Haror temples, which have, you know, they have an, an amazing assemblage of, of informal stuff, you know, that's buried, um, feasting, is there next to the formal temple. And so you have a sense that there are these, these two ritual spaces that are behaving very differently. And a lot of what you were talking about, and then I imagined, okay, what was it coming to this temple? I mean, you had to have all these people uh, sacrificing crows and puppies. There must have been cages with crows and puppies in them out there. And you know, this whole, this whole town or this whole enclosure, whatever it is, must have been devoted to sort of, you know, it's like a life of Brian uh, vision of it. You know, it's it's noisy, it's smelly, it's um, it, blood is spilling everywhere. I mean, this is what is actually happening in that in that temple site. And the same thing I had when I when I considered Kabri, and I was looking at all these um, burials there in the house, under the floor, in the courtyard, a doorway that leads from the courtyard down into this stinking chamber where where the corpses are introduced one after the other you know during decades and this brought home to me how how the dead were there in people's lives you know in these bronze age towns so it's not and, and you're right it's it's the house and the enclosure and there's of course the wall and maybe a palace up there where where they got all the wine but then you've got these other spaces where all this thinking garbage is piling up or where, or where things are decomposing. And, and as you said, the privies and all that. Um, and, and I find that use, thinking of your other senses will bring those out, right? It'll, it'll, make, them, it'll make them happen. So I found that as, as a useful hack for, for thinking about how, how these settlements hang together, you know, what, what people are seeing and doing in these settlements. There was a question, I saw a question right at the beginning, Matt, about why I ended at 1000 and what kind of year that is. And <laughs> part of that is Cambridge Archaeological Press saying you can't have any slashes in your title. It has to be a round number. So I couldn't, I couldn't play with that. And I said, yeah, okay, I'm going to just go out and say it. I don't know when the Bronze Age ends in, in the Levant. And we know, I think in Cyprus, Tell me if I'm wrong. The Bronze Age does go all the way to the end of the of the second millennium. Sorry, uh, 1050 BC. The, oh, we call okay. it the late Cypriot 3B, but we consider this. It's a, it's a it's a mistake of the Swedish who established a chronological <laughs> system. We consider it to finish at uh, at the beginning of the 11th century. So, yeah, the 12th uh -huh. is included in the Bronze Age for us as as in the Aegean. Right, so, so, so this is fluid. Um, I don't have an ideology about it. And I just put it out there to get people riled up, you know, to, to provoke this discussion of is, is there an Iron Age one, really? Does that period even exist? And I just say, I'm just leaving that out there and letting, um, you know, the person who's writing the next volume on the Iron Age uh, worry about it. And I certainly, um, you know, I'm long past the days in which I wrote about the Iron Age, so I'm not too concerned. Rafi, these are, this is a good um, line of questioning because I think the more that we learn about all of these periods and the higher resolution that our data, data becomes, the more irrelevant these terms are that we are throwing around Iron Age, Bronze Age, Iron One, LB3. Um, I would imagine that during the course of your writing of the book that you probably wrestled with what do I really mean by using these old terms? Mm -hmm. Completely, and 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 that was a sense of being at, at being at some at some turning point. That is, I was standing on the shoulders of all the people who have done this work, and everything has been written in that terminology. So I'm not going to start confusing everyone by inventing a new term, which you'd have to add in parentheses the old term right next to it, just like um, with. SLMW that uh, Yuval was complaining about. But um, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm sometimes terribly inconsistent and I can't, maybe someday we'll, we'll you know, s sit over um, a drink and talk about how, how, the, how Metallic Bird changed its name over time. But it all has to do with the internal discussion among the, 
EB people and the sort of arcane group about how to, how to name things. Uh, but you have to be careful about inventing new periods because then you, you just have all the old periods trailing, trailing that in parentheses. Uh, and, and, and what is really needed is, is a complete revolution. And I sort of alluded to this right at the beginning of the book when I said, look, these terms, Iron Age, Bronze Age, that's just the gang of four, you know, 1922, they decided that that's how, that's how we're going to say it. And maybe, uh, you know, 100 years later, it's, it's coming up, maybe you should have a conference in 1922 and say, you know, okay, we've had 100 years of this, do we need it anymore? Maybe we should move on. Uh, just to say, Rafi, I think that, you know, you said, you know, we don't necessarily need new terms, but at the same time, you did, you created a new term that this TBI, Transitional Bronze Iron Age. And I actually like the term very much because I think it gives you that flexibility to absorb both the sort of end of the late Bronze Age and, and this sort of extended Iron One period. And it, it does, it does fit. I think that it's, um, it works and we'll have to see if people start using it, I guess. I, I have to say, I, 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 I plagiarized that. I didn't plagiarize it. I oh, took it from, I took it from, um, from uh, Mario, uh, Mario Martin. So oh, okay, right. His makes... book about Egyptian, and I, and I guess it's, it's a term that's floating around there among the um, 13th, 12th century people. It's good, I think it's a useful term. Okay. I have a couple questions from the Q&A section. Um, I'll try, several of them are similar, so I'll try to package them together. First of all, Rafi, as an EB person, how do you feel, not how do you feel, how do you think the decoupling of the end of the early Bronze Age three from the environmental collapse affects future research questions? I wrote several times I came back to the uh, to the environmental question and I really don't see it as a prime mover for anything. And I, I also found it really strange that sometimes the same climate change will induce a collapse and in another case it will include, induce a regeneration. Or and and of course that's possible because because the Levant is constructed that way. That is that when you lose one one sort of uh, niche for settlement, you gain another one. If things are drying out, then swamplands become inhabitable. If things are getting wetter, then desert um, low precipitation areas are becoming easier to, to inhabit and everything within a distance of, of 10, 15 kilometers. So people don't have to just you know, leave and abandon an entire landscapes here. Um, and, and, I, and I used a phrase which, which I think is provocative and I wonder if it works. I mean, this is the kind of thing that that people can argue with, really. And I said the stakes are low. That is, um, you know, the, the changes aren't dramatic, aren't dramatic because the, the stakes are relatively low. If people have to leave, they don't have to leave, you know, and, and cross the Mediterranean to a, to a new continent. They just have to pick up their stuff and, and, and move east or west or whatever it is. Uh, and, and, and my sense is that I never, connected the, um, there have been very many kinds of environmental degradation attached to the EB3. Kathleen Kenyon said that the town dwellers cut down the trees all around their, their towns and, you know, made, uh, brought the desert into, into proximity. And then um, Arlene Rosanne has written about down cutting of streams and, you know, changes in the, um, in, 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 in the, uh, in, in, the, in the way precipitation was um, distributed uh, during the rainy season. So there's so many micro changes and, and I don't think any of them really adds up to deterministic explanation. They're all contributing factors along with other things. I'll follow that up with another question from the Q&A list. Um, to what extent do you think anthropogenic landscapes continue to change as urban pathways develop in the Middle Bronze and Late Bronze? And to what extent do you think they got locked by certain early bronze choices? 
you mm. think anthropogenic landscapes have been addressed for the MB and LB to the same extent as for late prehistory? Uh, I, I, I don't have a, <laughs> an opinion on that, on that question. I mean, it's, it's certainly something that's worth, that's worth studying. And I did write about uh, or I have thought about how um, it's it's the middle grounds really in which in which t t mounds are built, you know, from from scratch, in which in which that idea of of, uh, of a mound with a palace or a temple on top of it becomes uh, super important, and you have these huge earthworks. But that's not landscaping, and I'm, I'm not sure that's that's changing the actual landscape. So if you're talking about terracing or or um, Large-scale irrigation. I'm not. I'm not sure. I see it, and I would have to think about this question more. It's not. It's not something I was able or thought I could address in this book. Rafi, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you didn't like about the book. What I didn't like about the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of you read a quote which was unending. That is a sentence that was extremely long. I think it was Jack. Uh, read a very long sentence, and I have a tendency to write long sentences. And and my wife says that she needs a dictionary to read the book, which is which is not so good because I do want people in the Levant to read the book, and not only um, in in uh, you know uh, Oxbridge or or the Ivy League or something. So uh, it's something we have to think about at what register we write and. Uh, it's difficult. We're not writer. We're not natural um, um, li literary writers, but we do have to think about who is reading our book and if it's and if it's di digestible. So I I wonder, and I I am expecting someone to say that that might be an issue. There's one thing. Um, another is. Uh, is a certain cap that I had on illustrations. So I really had a lot fewer than I would have liked to have had. And there are often issues that need an illustration and they either don't have one or they have one that is too small or, or not informative enough. It, you know, it's, it's okay, but not great. Okay, I won't torture you into making a longer list. <laughs> uh, one last question from the question and answer section. Um, getting a little bit specific with the late early Bronze Age and intermediate Bronze Age and the question of the black wheel made wear. Mm -hmm. uh, now that we have this new chronology that we're wrestling with, what, how do you feel about these traditional uh, uh, pegs in chronology that we've associated with things like pottery types? And I'm not sure where that question is headed. We have and we have this very long intermediate Bronze Age, which everyone wants to divvy up and find an early intermediate bronze and later intermediate bronze. And sometimes you can tease it out. So it looks like some of the negative sites are earlier in the sequence and looks at some, like some of these northern sites are later in the sequence. And this um, this style of ceramics, which see, which which is centered somewhere north of of the Southern Levant, maybe somewhere in the Beka or, or, or you know, somewhere nearby, and is certainly related to things that are happening in Syria. I mean, Lynn, Lynn knows this better than, than I. There is a fairly secure date for that. And you know, it's not difficult to put it in, what is it, 22nd century or something like that, rather than the 24th, right? I mean, that's sort of, that, that, that's sort of, Fairly secure, and then beyond that, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not too worked up about about putting very precise dates. You know, Artemis mentioned before 1050 for the end of the Bronze Age. You know, maybe it was 1025. I mean, you know, what, what makes you so sure it's it's 50 or so? I I don't know if we should if we should exercise ourselves over 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 that sort of resolution. Um, I mean, obviously there are cases where it's super important to get to that kind of resolution. And we really have to make peace with the nature of the evidence. So often, you know, uh, C14 is what it is. Sometimes it's a, it's a clock that gives you every second and sometimes it's a clock that measures days or hours. 
you know, it, it, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, it's not something that I would get worked up about. Another thing that I was thinking about as I was reading the book, um, you know, you, you have the quote by Borges, right? About story, about narrative. And I was thinking actually, it reminded me of Italo Calvino's Castle of Cross Destinies, where all of these travelers end up at this medieval castle and they're struck mute. So they have to tell their stories about what's happened to them through tarot cards. And it's all about interpretation and about subjectivity and your view of the world. And in a lot of ways, um, for me, the way that you told the story about the Bronze Age is being very, very specific about situated knowledges and viewpoints, but also where your view is obscured and you're very open about that. Um, but it's also tied to that materiality, just like those folks with the tarot cards, they've only got those cards. They have to tell a story that is associated with those cards. They can't go outside of it uh, unless they're very clever and they, they can inspire that kind of imagination. So I'm just really, again, really impressed with how you took such a massive amount of information, again, standing on the shoulders of those giants and tried to, tried to tell a narrative about what life was like in the past. So I just wanted to thank you again for that. Thanks, Meredith, and, and, and thank you all. Does anyone want to add anything? Because I want to say just a few words of thanks um, to Matt and, uh, and the panel. Wrap it then up. I'll wrap, I'll wrap it up then. So, so thanks, um, Jack and Meredith and Artemis and, and Lynn and Yuval um, for joining me here. Uh, it was great. Uh, not only to hear the appreciations, but to hear what what uh, what it evoked or provoked in, in your own thinking, and um, and and thanks Matt for for hosting this meeting. Uh, thanks everybody out there, the people that we don't see for attending. Uh, feel free to write to me if you have any uh, you know backstairs thoughts as 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 you leave, uh, and. Um, I hope we can meet in, in the flesh and not too distant future, whether at the Albright or anywhere else, at the Ikane or whatever. So thanks again to everyone. Um, and good night here in, in Jerusalem. All right, thanks to everybody, including the Thank panelists you. and the attendees. It's really been a great time. Uh, I posted a number of things in the chat that might be of interest to you, some links to Rafi's research uh, some links for you to make donations to the Albright so that we can continue to host scholars like Rafi. Um, that's it for now. I think next week we'll be posting a schedule of other events like this for 2021. So please be on the lookout for that. Check out our Facebook page and our website uh, to sign up for notifications. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank, Good night. You, Thank, you, Thank you, Congratulations Thank you, again. Thank you.